Hi, I'm Jeff Klein, editor of Radiographics, and today I'm pleased to have with us Dr. Catherine Wallet and Dr. Tara Barwick, both from the Imperial College Healthcare Trust in London, uh, UK, who are the authors of one of our featured papers in the current September 2017 issue of Radiographics. The paper is entitled Clinical Pet Imaging in Prostate Carcinoma. Drs. Wallet and Barwick, welcome to our podcast. Hi, thank you. So let me begin with uh, Dr. Wallet. Uh, your paper provides a very nice review of the role of various pet tracers in the evaluation of prostate cancer. And you provide details on the utility of various agents for specific situations in these patients. What we'll do is show table one in the paper, which lists the available pet tracers uh, that are reviewed in this paper. Let's begin by discussing the role of uh, 18 uh, FDG PET in particular its role and limitations in prostate cancer, uh, which has led to the development of alternative tracers uh, for this condition. Perhaps at the end we can show figure one, which illustrates the limitations of FDG PET for regional, nodal, and bone metastases. Dr. Wallet? Thank you. Um, so yeah, FDG is an established tracer in the oncological imaging for a wide variety of cancers and is FDA approved for these. Um, it's the most widely available cancer, but unfortunately it's um, got limited benefits in the imaging of prostate cancer, which is the second most common cancer in the world. Um, and this is mainly due to the relatively low glucose metabolism of prostate cancers, as prostate cancer tends to rely on fatty acid metabolism rather than glucose metabolism. So in the localization of disease, data has shown that um, FDG cannot reliably distinguish between benign and malignant disease. So there's often an FDG uptake overlap between prostate cancer itself and benign conditions such as hepatitis and benign prostatic hyperplasia. Um, in staging and biochemical relapse, prostate cancer metastases such as nodal or bony metastases are often also mildly FDG avid for the reasons that um, I've just uh, mentioned. Um, but there might be some situations that FDG PET is useful in prostate cancer, um, particularly as, as prostate cancer evolves from an indolent to a more aggressive castrate resistant state, lesions tend to demonstrate increased FDG avidity. And therefore it might be useful in the response assessment of osseous metastases particularly as new um, or novel systemic therapies become available. Um, there's also some data suggesting that, that, that FDG may have a role as a prognostic indicator, which would be a useful and non-invasive biomarker of disease. Great. Um, can we take a look at figure one uh, and just review the uh, findings uh, that are, uh, really show sort of the limitations of FDG PET in this, in this particular setting? Yeah, so, um, so in this patient who presented with lymphadenopathy above and below the diaphragm, the primary diagnosis was thought to be lymphoma. And so an FDG PET was arranged for this to stage and guide a site for biopsy. And interestingly, the large volume nodal disease only demonstrated mild increased metabolic activity. Um, subsequent biopsy demonstrated high grade metastatic prostate cancer with a Gleason score of four plus five. Um, the patient also had multiple bone metastases, which you can see from the sagittal view, are only mildly FDG avid on the fused um, picture, but you can see that they're clearly demonstrated on the bone scan study adjacent to it. Um, so it's a good example of how um, FDG PET can underestimate the burden of disease in prostate cancer um, because of the relatively low glucose metabolism of the tumor. Great, thank you very much. Dr. Borwick, it, it's pretty clear from your paper that choline has particular advantages in the setting of prostate cancer. Uh, can you review the various choline traces that are available for use and, and discuss their relative role in the localization of the primary tumor, the staging of prostate cancer, uh, the utility for detection of nodal and bone disease, and specifically patients with biochemical relapse of disease. Also, at the end, let's review figure nine, which I think is a nice demonstration of the utility of C11 choline in this particular setting. Sure. So, choline is an essential component of phospholipids in cell membranes, and cell membrane metabolism is upregulated in prostate cancer. Currently, there are three different choline PET tracers which are available. The first of these, C11 choline, has a short half-life of only 20 minutes. This means that it's really only available to the site with a cyclotron 
at its um, site because it can't be transported to other sites. So that's quite a big limitation. However, there are two F18 labelled tracers, uh, fluoro e-filecholine and fluoro methylcholine. These tracers like F18 FTG have a half-life of 110 minutes. So that means it can be distributed to centres locally within about an hour away of the main centre, meaning that it can have more widespread clinical use. In terms of the three different tracers, there's really no significant difference in diagnostic performance between the three. Um, whichever tracer is used basically depends on the availability of that tracer. So moving on now to its role in localization and staging, in terms of localizing prostate cancer and the T staging of prostate cancer, there really is no role of calling PET. Multiparametric MRI is far superior because as Catherine has uh, already alluded to, and as is with most of the PET tracers, we cannot reliably discriminate between benign prostatic hypertrophy and tumours. And also the spatial resolution of PET is such that we can't reliably decide if there's extracapsular extension or seminal vesicle involvement for the tumour staging. However, in nodal staging, there have been several meta-analyses which have shown that choline is highly specific. Uh, however, the sensitivity is somewhat variable, and the sensitivity is best in prostate cancer staging of high-risk patients. So in patients who would have a higher prevalence of nodal disease, the diagnostic performance in terms of sensitivity is quite high. However, in general, we do not use it for routine staging, only when there's equivocal findings on conventional workup. In terms of bone metastases, the most widespread uh, diagnostic tool is planar bone scan because it is cheap and widely available, but it just assesses osteoblastic activity, which is not specific to cancer, and certainly calling PET has been shown to be both more sensitive and specific than bone scintigraphy. But the main role to date for calling PET is in the setting of biochemical relapse. And in that setting where PSA is rising post radical prostatectomy or radical radiotherapy, it has very good diagnostic performance com compared to conventional workup with bone scan, CT and MRI. So for its well, for C11 choline, a meta-analysis has reported that the overall detection rates are of the order of 62%, and similar uh, detection rates have been reported for uh, F18 choline as well. However, one of the um, things that people need to be aware of is that the detection rate is dependent on the PSA level and also PSA kinetics, such that when the PSA level is quite low post-radical prostatectomy, so when it's less than one, for example, and you're really trying to pick up micrometastatic disease or very small sites of disease in the pelvis, uh, the detection rate drops off to around 20 to 30 percent. So really, choline is best when the um, PSA levels are greater than one post-radical prostatectomy, and that is what the recent European Association of Urology guidelines have recommended. In the, the same guidelines, in the scenario where a patient has had previous radiotherapy and still has a prostate in situ, the guidelines would recommend doing a multiparametric MRI, first of all, because you can better assess the prostate itself. And if it, they're then deemed potentially suitable for salvage uh, radical treatment, then they would, could go on to have a choline or a PSMA after that. Um, and uh, choline does have FDA approval for uh, the biochemical relapse in prostate cancer in the US. Great. Um, can we just review briefly figure nine, which I think is a nice demonstration of the use of C11 choline uh, in, the, in this particular setting? Sure. So in this case, it's a 77-year-old man who had previously had uh, radical radiation therapy and his PSA was rising. His PSA was six at the time of the scan and he'd already had a multiparametric MRI of his pelvis 
CT chest, abdomen and pelvis and a bone scan and no site of disease have been found. So you can see from this lip image that there are several tiny lymph nodes which have been arrowed in the paraortic chain and left common iliac chain, which were all well below size criteria on the CT component of the study. So it's in this scenario where really Colleen has the best role in picking up disease compared to conventional workup. Terrific, thank you. Catherine, let's move back to you. Um, Gallium-68 prostate-specific membrane antigen, uh, which is the topic actually of an upcoming paper in, in the January 2018 issue of Radiographics, uh, I understand from your paper is somewhat of a misnomer. Uh, nevertheless, it seems to be emerging as a useful tool uh, in specific situations in patients with prostate cancer. Can you discuss the specific role of gallium-68 in patients with prostate cancer? Uh, and we'll look at figure 13 at the end of your discussion as an example of a patient with suspicion of uh, biochemical relapse of prostate cancer. Yeah, so PSMA, prostate-specific membrane antigen, the name itself is a bit misleading. Um, it targets, the petrase targets a large transmembrane protein which isn't specific to prostate cancer or prostate cells. Um, and that's actually quite an important concept because um, it's not only applicable to PSMA traces, but also the other traces that we discuss in the article, um, that uptake of these traces can actually be seen both on a physiologic level and also in benign and malignant unrelated conditions. But of course, we have the advantage of interrogating the distribution of activity and also looking at the CT component to try and distinguish whether it's related to prostate cancer or not. But yes, so gallium-68 PSMA um, is a promising and very exciting uh, pet tracer available in the imaging of prostate cancer, and it's got both diagnostic and therapeutic potential. Um, Compared with choline, the biodistribution is favourable, so it has less marrow activity, which is useful in detecting bone metastases, which is a common site of um, metastatic disease and prostate cancer. And there have been a couple of meta-analyses comparing PSMA with choline, um, which demonstrates that PSMA is superior. So it's higher detection rates, higher tumour to background ratios, and at lower PSA levels compared with choline. So this is actually quite exciting and a window of opportunity for us to detect disease earlier um, or identify oligometastatic disease with the aim of um, therapeutic intervention for curative intent or possibly to influence patient outcomes on a positive, in a positive way. But of course, this is yet to be determined. Um, there is emerging use for uh, gallium-68 PSMA in high-risk staging. Um, it may have a role if the patient is um, fit for radical therapy um, and if we can detect metastatic disease, which would preclude this. Um, but where the body of evidence is strong is in the setting of biochemical relapse, um, which Tara has briefly mentioned with uh, choline. Um, this is recently reflected in the guidelines in the European Association of Urology, um, recommending its use in biochemical relapse following radical prostatectomy if the PSA is more than one. But following radical radiotherapy, as the most common site of disease is in the prostate, a multi-parametric MRI is initially indicated in the setting. Um, I think we have an example um, which, yes. we can, which nicely illustrates um, the, a case where a patient had radical prostatectomy and a rising PSA of 5, biochemical relapse. And on initial review, there's nothing too obvious, but, and this highlights actually a um, imaging pitfall of where um, physiologic bladder activity can mask um, sites of disease. Right. So there is an apparent uh, bulge at the right posterior bladder, and when we widen the windows, we can see an intense um, site of focal activity, which correlates on the um, diagnostic MRI uh, with a site of uh, recurrent disease at the prostatectomy bed. Um, so this is a nice example of how uh, the PSMA has demonstrated um, recurrent disease. Terrific. Thanks so much. Tara, let's move on to uh, F18 uh, flucyclovine, which is a synthetic amino acid analog uh, PET tracer. And let's discuss the role of this recently FDA-approved tracer in the evaluation of biochemical relapse of prostate cancer. 
Yes, so uh, amino acid metabolism is also upregulated in prostate cancer. And fusiclofene is a synthetic leucine amino acid analog. And it's taken up by sodium dependent transporters across the cell, which are upregulated in prostate cancer. Initial studies have shown that there's very favorable biodistribution of fusiclofene with less bladder and renal excretion, which can be useful for assessing disease around the prostate bed and bladder base, as Catherine had shown in the previous uh, image, can be problematic at times. Initial studies have also shown that fusiclofene is able to demonstrate extraprostatic sites of disease and also sites within the prostate. But as with the other PET tracers, unfortunately, there's still some overlap between the uptake in BPH and prostate cancer. However, in the setting of biochemical relapse, there has been a very large multicenter study of over six, uh, nearly 600 patients, which has shown that fusiclofene has high overall detection rates of 67.7%, but notably also had high detection rates in patients with low PSI rises post-radical prostatectomy. So in patients with PSA, of less than 0.79, they showed detection rates of 41%, which is really quite impressive. Um, it has also been shown in a small single center study to change management in the setting of biochemical relapse. And currently in the UK, there has been a large multi-center study, which primary aim has to be, has, is to assess the uh, change in management of using fusiclovine in the diagnostic pathway of men with biochemical relapse and their interim analysis was held recently and they've closed the trial early because the results are promising and these results will be reported in next month at ASCO so we'll await to hear but on the basis of the evidence so far um, it has received FDA approval and studies have shown that it is that has better diagnostic performance than choline PET but as yet there has not been a direct study comparing it to gallium 68 PSMA. Terrific. Thanks so much for that. Uh, Kathleen, let's uh, finally talk briefly about the role of sodium fluoride uh, F18 PET uh, in particular for the detection of bone metastases uh, in these particular patients? Yeah, so sodium fluoride has actually been around for quite a while. Um, it's got a very similar mechanism of action to um, technique phosphonates, which is used in bone scintigraphy, so it targets sites of osteoblastic activity. Um, but bone scintigraphy became favorable, favorable because um, gamma cameras were more available than PET scanners. Um, it's... FDA approved for the evaluation of metastatic bone disease and treatment response, and it is superior to bone scintigraphy, even with spec CT. Um, it's got shorter scanning times and um, a higher sensitivity with better imaging quality and tumor to background ratios. And although it's very, very sensitive, it has relative lack of specificity um, as it doesn't target viable tumor cells, only go to sites of osteoblastic activity. So we can um, uptake in benign conditions such as um, degenerative disease or trauma, for example. Um, another important point with this tracer is that it only assesses bone, which is a disadvantage when you compare it to the other PET tracers, um, which may allow the assessment of both bone and soft tissue in one setting. All right. Terrific. Well, thank you so much. Well, doctors Catherine Wallet and Tara Barwick, uh, I want to thank you for taking the time today to discuss your paper. Uh, on the clinical uh, use of PET imaging in prostate carcinoma, which can be found in the current September 2017 issue of Radiographics. Doctors, thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you. you.